Welcome to Plymouth, Tony. Um, this is a, an interesting time politically, uh, but it's also, I guess, an opportunistic time as well. It is indeed, and in, in the wake of the shock of Brexit, a shock for environmentalists who for more than 40 years have become very used to seeing the European Union as a source of, of leadership and of setting the bar and uh, a source of regulations and requiring our country to do things, now into a place where potentially that's no longer going to be the case and we're now looking at an uncertain future compared with what, with what was there before. But also a period of huge opportunity uh, because what we did have before Evidently, if you look at the trends in terms of wildlife populations, air pollution, uh, waste generation, we're not where we need to be. So we need to go further, and this could be a moment when we do go further, adopting new legislation, new targets, radical new ideas in sectors like agriculture. All that could happen, yeah. and it's not really a question of whether we can do that. I think it's much more a question now of whether we can inspire the public support to, to back that kind of program. And, and it looks like we got a Secretary of State that actually is maybe is pushing in that direction, certainly. Yes, uh, so uh, the, 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 there is a, a leader in, in the Cabinet on the environment side who's a big beast in British politics. He, he's got a lot of weight and heft, got access to number 10. He's, he's a very big figure in the Conservative Party. And he is taking all of this extremely seriously. And so unlike all of his predecessors who either did nothing or did the wrong thing, he's actually now moving in a pro-environmental direction in a way which I think has taken quite a lot of us by surprise yeah. in a very, very good way. Yeah, no, absolutely. In the sense of picking up our uh, agenda and really running with it. And I think uh, against that, it seems to be kind of causing great turbulence in the farming community because it's switching to this idea of valuing biodiversity. Yes, exactly. And so, so the, the, the farmers under the old regime were, were, were being used to basically being paid for, for having farmland rather than being uh, in a position of delivering public goods. And so the new Secretary of State has picked up this idea of public money for public goods. And the, the economist's definition of, pub, of public goods is things that are not in the market. So carbon capture, water quality, wildlife populations, amenity, beauty, all of these things that you don't pay for in food prices he's now looking to shift the subsidy regime towards the provision of those things for the public good because the market doesn't deliver them. And so this is really quite a radical idea. And if we get that right, uh, something that you know, could be really an exemplar for the whole world. And so that 30 kind of 30 year environment plan kind of sets out that policy framework, that roadmap. I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, do you feel that's a coherent way forward? There's some good stuff in there, in, in, in that plan. Uh, the, the idea, the headline idea of, of recovering nature within a generation and leaving the environment better than we found it, this is all very good. Uh, but that kind of plan, and experience shows us this very well, it may not survive a change of minister, never mind a change of government. And that's why we're putting so much effort across the environmental community now into a new Act of Parliament, an Environment Act that can put there a legal baseline. So if we are saying we're going to leave the environment in better shape than we found it, let's have a law that says that, so that when Michael Gove has moved on and there's a different government and there's a different constellation of ministers, they will have to come back to it and deliver on the same long-term goal. Because the recovery of nature is not going to be delivered by any single government, no matter how green they are. This is a 25, 30, 50 year program. So we need the longevity of action there going in the same direction. And the really great news is that we've already done this with the Climate Change Act. The principle is proven. Back in 2008, so uh, 10 years ago, uh, we had the Climate Change Act come in for exactly that reason. We have to cut emissions over a, a period of decades, not a year or one government or two governments, but successive governments. And so we have to hand the baton on from minister to minister. And exactly the same principle prevails now. So that plan is good, but it's only as good as its implementation. And that, we argue, is only going to be as good as a legal requirement. So it's switching from that, that we've got a short term opportunity and we need to embed it into that longer term kind of perspective. Really. Exactly. We, we, we've got to capture the long term. And actually, this is always the challenge with environmental priorities in politics, because politics is often quite short term, let's face it, and increasingly so with social media and rolling news headlines. The agenda is flipping from this way to that way and it's very hard to keep focus on anything. And the environment, you know, it comes up, then it goes yeah. down again and there'll be another economic crisis and it will disappear. So if we are going to deliver on these long term goals, they, they have to be 
into uh, some legal framework, something substantial that requires the ministers to come back to it again and again. And on climate change, we've done that and it's worked and it's been very good. And so I was interested when you were saying about that this could be a model for, for, your, for, the, for the globe. Yes. Tell us about that, because one of the things I guess is how it fits into things like sustainable development goals and all these other grand challenges. So if, if you look at the Environment Act idea that we're, we're pressing for and looking at the farming reforms and put those two things together, that could lead to a transformation in the uh, trends affecting wildlife in this country. And at a time when we know we have a global mass extinction going on, this could be a very important example of how to do things how to differently. How to operationalise it. How to operationalise this, this idea of, of recovering wildlife. And I think, you know, as conservationists, we just need, need to stand back now and again and say, look, you know, we've been at this now for, for a century, and basically what we've been doing is, at best, slowing down the decline yeah. of animals and plants and natural ecosystems. And now we've got to start putting things back because we've gone beyond the low point that is sustainable. So if, if we are going to stop this mass extinction, we have to begin a period of recovering ecosystems. And so the thing then, you look at the globe, you look at Indonesia and Vietnam and all these countries with big social challenges as well as big economic difficulties, and then you ask yourself the question, if we can't do it in Britain, where can we do it? Yes, good point. This is a very important thing to bear in mind, isn't it? You know, this is one of the most developed, richest countries with the best scientists. The country has more environmentalists per capita than anywhere, millions of members of the Wildlife Trust, RSPB, WWF, we've got great support. If we can't convert that into a plan to recover nature here, yeah. then I don't think we've got much chance in um, many other parts of the world. So the leadership piece is crucial. You know, how do you see universities? At the moment, people are were quite monodisciplinary and very attached to their own little areas, but these are systemic, holistic problems. What, yes. what do you see universities, do they need to change to address these, these issues as training yeah. grounds? I, I think probably uh, the, if, if there's one big thing I've learned over many years in, in environmental campaigning and activism and thinking, it's, it's how there is no one solution. Everything is connected to everything else. And so if, if you look at the biodiversity challenges and the climate change and the food security and the economic and the development, they're all fundamentally connected to one another. And so if we are going to navigate this, this set of problems, we need to have an integrated, joined up, holistic approach. And I guess in the academic community, that translates into the idea of multidisciplinary uh, collaboration, doesn't it, across different departments. Certainly in Cambridge, where I, I, I have some uh, work with the university, in, and speak a lot with the so-called Cambridge Conservation Initiative, which is an, an agglomeration of the academics plus some of the uh, global groups like BirdLife International and FFI. One of the things I've suggested we might want to try and do more there is to try and unite our work much more with the social sciences. So, you know, there's great biologists, great zoologists, great uh, landscape ecologists, but actually we need psychologists, we need economists, we need sociologists involved, probably historians and philosophers too, because that is where the actual answers Because we need to affect behavioural change. We've got to affect behaviour change. And the other thing I kind of just um, observe as I go along is that the animals are fine. It's the people we have to worry about. <laughs> the animals will look after themselves if they're given a chance. Yeah, given and giving them a chance space. is all about changing people and their institutions yeah. and their ideas. I normally ask at this kind of point if, if you're an optimist or a pessimist, but it's kind of pointless because you're obviously an optimist, aren't yes, you? Yes, I, th I, think, I think you have to be uh, an optimist to do this kind of work because we have to inspire some sense of hope in the face of all of this data we have. And it doesn't paint a pretty picture if we look at all of the trends that are out there. Um, I think probably the shortest route to defeat is pessimism in the sense of just presenting that and then giving a sense of nothing can be done. And that's quite easy to believe if you look at yeah. the population, the economic growth, the climate change urgency and everything else. So I think we have to paint a picture of a better world that comes from addressing this and moving beyond the idea that it's about sacrifice or we've got to give up something or we're all going to have to live in caves. You know, that is sometimes the narrative and baggage that the environmentalists have carried it's with kind of project them. fear for the environment. Really. Exactly. We, we need to be beyond that. It's a tricky challenge because we do have to, at the same time, convey that sense of urgency. Uh, but it can be done. And years ago, when I worked at Friends of the Earth, you know, we had a long discussion about how we were going to run a campaign for a climate change act. And we said we've got to do two things at once. We've got to, on the one hand, paint the picture of the urgent need for action, and on the other, the benefits of that. And you know, it worked and I, I think it can be done. It's quite complicated, but you know, it's in the realm of psychology, communications and how we put these messages over to people. 
but with a big bit of optimism. I think it's essential. Well, I look forward to hearing the story tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Very nice to be here.